Thou hast desired thy life for man. Now that has something that has something that is almost as small as the eye of a needle in it. <laughs> Notice the aimless moat. <clears throat> thy aim an aimless moat. What's a moat? Anybody know what a moat is? Yeah, it's like a tiny piece of dust. So, oh, it looks like part of the castle. Yeah, it's an aimless moat. Not that kind of moat. That's what I was thinking. I thought it was part of it. This is why we never get anything done here. <laughs> All right, choir. And if you have no. something to add, Catherine? Or no. You? Okay. <laughs> Fire and everybody else that, especially that has learned this, you all can help us, help us on this too. Mm -hmm. Oh God, oh Lord, God and Is there are kind of 
two ways of thinking about music, and I think of this especially when it comes to children's music. Sometimes with children's music, we teach children music that they grow out of. And I'm sure you've heard of that, heard of that, that phrase or that expression. Um, and, and some of that, of course, is okay, maybe even good. But we also want to teach music that they are going to grow into and that they are going to keep kind of throughout their life. So the hymns that we teach, the hymns that we sing, are not just are not just sort of throwaway things, but are things that are are meant to be read and prayed and sung over and over and over and over. And so, and sometimes that means sort of getting them is a little bit of work. But if you take a little bit of work to do it, once you get it, you kind of get it, and it can be amazing. Um, I first taught this hymn in the year 2000 at a at the very first Tire Things Youth Conference, where we had 600 teenagers and chaperones. This is what you might call a less than ideal audience for teaching hymnody. <laughs> okay, if ever there was a group that you would think, oh, they couldn't possibly learn stuff, especially something something like this, well, you would be absolutely wrong. <laughs> because they not only learned it, but learned to love it. And a part of it is because of some of, because the, the language and the poetry of it just kind of sticks with you. Uh, just hear a couple of these other, other stanzas. Our fatal will to equal thee, our rebel will wrought death and night, we seized and used in prideful spite thy wondrous gift of liberty. We housed us in this house of doom, where death had royal scope and room, until thy servant, Prince of Peace, breached all its walls for our release. <clears throat> so there's um, that, that, first of all, just a tiny bit of a tongue twister, right? <laughs> it doesn't just sort of, oh, 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 oh I got it, you know, our, our rebel will wrought death and night. You know that that takes a little bit of uh, concentration to get it. Uh, Thou camest to our hall of death, O Christ, to breathe our poisoned air, to drink for us the dark despair that strangled our reluctant breath. How beautiful the feet that trod the road that leads us back to God. How beautiful the feet that ran to bring the great good news to man. I really love that that line, to breathe our poisoned air, to drink for us the dark despair that strangled our reluctant breath. What, what do you think of when you think of that phrase, uh, reluctant breath? If you've ever had uh, asthma <laughs> or, or any kind of breathing problems, you realize that, that it's, it's not simply uh, breathing in that is the issue, although that can be, but also breathing out. <laughs> and that that breath, and it even can get to a point where uh, I'm afraid to breathe because I'm afraid of the pain that might come with breathing, the work, and all of this. And so you get this picture of our reluctant breath of praise, of thanksgiving, that we're not able to do because of this poisoned air that we're, that we're breathing kind of makes it so that I'm afraid to I'm afraid to live because of what's around me. And then the final one, O oh, Spirit who didst once restore thy church that it might be again the bringer of good news to men, breathe on thy cloven church once more. That in these gray and latter days there may be those whose life is praise, each life a high doxology to Father, Son, and unto thee. What does cloven mean? <laughs> Broken. Split. Yeah. You know, like a meat cleaver is a meat. <laughs> Although you don't normally actually cleave a meat in two with a meat cleaver. Maybe you do. I guess it's heavy. Um, but the, that, that even today we are split and fractured. And so we pray that, uh, that the Spirit would breathe on His church and would, would unite us together. Now this is, and this also, this hymn especially uses what I'll call um, uh, uh, old tiny language. <laughs> sort of, it, it sounds kind of sort of like old English, right? Most of our hymns don't do this, and I think that that's good. 
but uh, I don't think that they should. But uh, but I think it's okay for us occasionally to use uh, to use some. Uh, you know, you wouldn't say my faith looks up to you. That would be wrong. My faith looks up to thee, <laughs> thou Lamb of Calvary, etc. So anyway, it's a it's a remarkable hymn, and uh, I think you will really come to love it. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. On to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Bible classes continue as usual. I really like this whole habit of me not going out of town and just sort of being here week after week. It's really nice. I, kind of get, I can get used to this again. That's <laughs> okay, so, I'm sure. Pancake breakfast. Norb, did I see you or not? Yeah. There he is, Norb. Anything else you want to Say on that, still, still rolling along. Be I mean, sure to check your mailboxes because you, you got uh, information on it and the, the tickets are uh, in there, in the envelopes. Okay. So every family got five tickets. And what am I supposed to do with these tickets? I, I have six people in my family. Oh, uh, well, does that mean only five of them? Ask, ask, ask uh, your secretary for another one. She okay. Another one. If, if anybody needs more, we got more. You got more. Okay. Awesome. So that's November 10th. Veterans Day weekend, also Martin Luther's birthday, and a few other, few other fun days. Photography stuff, I don't know if we have any of our photo folks in here or not, but those are, I believe, coming up still. I saw them sitting out there, so I, I expect there's still time to sign up if you have not done so. Seminary Christmas, we're still collecting. It is outside in the mail room. You'll see a little box. Uh, I mentioned this for uh, last week. This is for gift cards for seminary students and their families for either traveling over the Christmas holiday or for getting Christmas gifts, etc. Um, when do we have to have that in by? Do you remember, Michelle? Like one of the first weekends in November. We yeah. Don't have much time. So we got a couple right now weeks. Right by the snacks. I moved it. Okay, it's by the snacks right now. Okay, so you'll see a little box that will look Christmassy. That's the one. Excellent. And cash and, and money is also okay. All right. Are there any other announcements? Marion. Um, if you are interested in hearing a, a great organ played by a great organist, this coming Friday, uh, Dana Robinson will be playing at First Lutheran in Yuba City uh, starting at 7.30. And I have postcards that give you all the information. If anybody's interested, just get one from me or you can ask for it right now. Um, this is real opportunity to hear um, fabulous organ music. Right. Or you can simply come to Holy Cross on any given Sunday. Well, that's true. <laughs> you get a whole hour. Yes. Okay. Various and sundry fabulous organists. But you can go there and you won't be interrupted by the sermon. <laughs> All right. We are back at Matthew chapter 26. And we kind of uh, started on this a little bit last week. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to one, one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. So I think last week we talked about reclining at table that these that the seating would be kind of like a, a U shape and that they would sit on one side of the table and then the servers would come and would serve on the other side of the table so they could see each other because it was shaped in a U. But they would not be facing directly each other because you know you wouldn't want to have a server actually reach over you. That would be totally uncouth. So you would not do that sort of thing. <coughs> Dipped his hand in the dish if you have ever uh, uh, eaten any kind of uh, Middle Eastern food, you will have some sense of what that uh, of what that is talking about. It's kind of a bread with various various sorts of sauces, etc. Would be pretty 
pretty common for uh, for food. It would be better for him if he had not been born. That is such a dark phrase, isn't it? Um, it is uh, it is very uh, very dark. I don't have any any kind of brilliant insight into it, <laughs> uh, other than just the, the uh, I think the, the sorrow that is implied in Jesus' words here. It would be better for him if he had not been if he had not been born. Um, that uh, that Jesus himself, who uh, who is the source of of life, would uh, would recognize that one of his disciples would would do this is kind of a remarkable and tragic picture. This is the this is the kind of the uh, the picture um, that we get with uh, many of the Lord's Supper paintings. They're act not actually paintings of the Lord's Supper. Oftentimes they're paintings of this uh, Jesus said, one of you will betray me. <laughs> and then they're all going, is it I, is it I, is it I? A lot of times that's actually what the picture is. It's at the, at the Last Supper, but that's the, that's the, the moment. Um, is it I, Rabbi, he said, you have said so. Who else does Jesus say that to? Pilate. Pilate. Yeah. Yeah, are you a king? <laughs> Pilate asked him, you have said so. Yeah, so... So they so they kind of make a um, I don't know an unintentional confession <laughs> of, uh, of 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 what's going on of what's happening there. Uh, again, it's a very uh, very because of course Judas knows that it's him. So why does he why does he ask? You know what you know would you you would think I would think that Judas would want to. Uh, Hide this, right? Why would he say it? Yeah, and maybe um, as a way of saying it's not my fault. I, I'm not choosing to do this. It's right. Something else is making me do it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there's there's some kind of uh, mitigation of guilt, perhaps. Ben and and it's Suzanne. He doesn't want Peter to chop off his ear. He doesn't want <laughs> Peter to chop off his ear. I like good bait. A good bait. Yeah. I love this kind of reminds me of what kids or something where it's like he wants to know if Jesus knows. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that that's I I think is the most likely response. This is the did I do it? What do you think? <laughs> Not that you know any any of my Lutheran children would ever do such things of course. But uh, yeah that that's kind of my my implication. He wants to know what Jesus knows. Yeah. Now once again Human beings do not have to make sense, right? <clears throat> and and just like Mom always knows, Jesus always knows. <laughs> and uh, and Judas has witnessed many miracles of of you know physical miracles, miracles of Jesus stating uh, stating he knows their thoughts, all kinds of things. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes you're still going to ask. Because you've still got this needling thought in the back of your head that maybe I can get away with it this time, right? I mean, that's kind of what—that's a part of what sin does. I think is it is it convinces us you can get away with it this time. Now, if everybody else asked, he didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> right? Maybe he felt like he had to because everybody else did ask earlier. Yeah, they were very sorrowful. We'll began to say to one. Maybe one after another. Is it I, Lord? Yeah. Yeah, so he's like, well, if I don't ask, then I'm kind of looking guilty. Yeah, I can see that, too. That makes very good sense. Dennis? The difference being, he said, is it I, Rabbi? Hmm. Yeah, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Rabbi? It uh, could be. Right? I mean, Lord is the, you know, is, is certainly a higher honorific. Yeah. I, uh, I wonder see that. if Judas never, never, ever accepted him as the Son of God. That's a good question. Mm. And, and as, we'll, uh, as we'll see kind of moving on, there is a lot of speculation about Ju Judas's faith or lack of faith. Um, somebody asked last, last week about whether or not Judas took, took 
the, the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper or not. Um, what, uh, you know, so there's a lot of questions about kind of what happened with Judas. Um, I just at the outset, I'm going to say Jesus saying it would be better for him if he if if he had not been born is kind of an indication that Judas does not die in faith. I I think that that's pretty clear from Jesus Jesus statement here. Whatever else is going on, that it does not end well for him. Does that does that follow for everybody? Yeah, Rick. I, I think it totally is, because obviously he had to be betrayed, right? Right. I mean, he came right. for one purpose, that was to die. Right, right. yeah. So, well, and and that, of course, is a, is a part of the interesting thing with this whole narrative, is all of these things happen in fulfillment of prophecy. We know that this is going to happen. Um, and yet, at the same time, there is not a, um, a fatalism about it. That's, that's what you get a lot of time. You get, you know what I mean by fatalism? This sort, this sort of sense that this is what, how it was always going to happen in this exact way, this exact time. You get a lot of fatalism in Greek mythology. Greeks were all about fatalism. The Stoics were, were fatalists, kind of believing that everything, everything that happened, that there is never any kind of free will of any sort, and that everything that happens is foreordained, and and so. While you can try to uh, while you can try to resist your uh, your your fate, uh, ultimately it is not going to work. You can't resist you can't resist fate. I'm really tempted to go down a rabbit trail about Star Wars. But <laughs> is is the statement it would be better if he had not been born like a general statement that would go towards all people that die outside the faith, or would that be, would it be better that people had been born even if they die outside the faith in general? This is that's a good question. And I, and, uh, that's a good question, for which I don't have an answer. But I, I think also we might ask, is Judas the only one who betrays Jesus? <laughs> right? I mean, we, we get Judas. Clearly, we get Judas has a, a unique role, a unique betrayal, the 30 pieces of silver, handing him over, etc. But all of them forsake him and flee. Peter denies him, you know, the, so so the kind of the the betrayal and the guilt sort of moves out to the whole world. Uh, so I I do think that uh, we do have to be careful not to sit in kind of righteous self-righteous judgment over over anyone not Judas not anybody because that's a that's a, a fast way to lead to arrogance and pride which is not going to end well either everybody yeah and kind of a follow-up to what you just said I'm kind of struggling with with uh, what you said a little bit earlier that it didn't probably didn't turn out good for Judas because if it was destined and if it was to be and if Judas was the unlucky one that was used to make that happen, I'm just struggling with the whole. Oh, I get it, and that's good, and, and I understand your struggle. I wish I, I wish I could ease that. We are trapped and bound by sin. We're not trapped and bound in the same way by God. I'm I gonna feel, yeah, please. I feel that um, that him saying that he's better off not have been born because not because God is not going to forgive him because God is all forgiving. Sure, that's not the and question. And he can be forgiven, but the guilt that he's going to carry is going to make his life, the rest of his life, miserable to the point that it would be better that he not be born. Well, and remember, we do get, because of course we're seeing this from the perspective of knowing the rest of the story, we, we do get that Judas hangs himself, and we do get in other places in the scriptures uh, that, that Judas rejects the faith to his death. So, so it, the question isn't whether or not God would forgive him, 
The question is whether or not Judas repents. And clearly he doesn't. <laughs> and that's the and that's the the sorrow of it. I would say, which is kind of I think what Ben was trying to get at a little bit a little bit earlier was that um, is this sorrow not not simply over Judas but over all who die outside the faith? Yes, ma'am. You had your did you have your hand up before? No. Okay. Uh, great. I think it's deep in his book that says it so well that. Judas goes out and hangs himself at the exact moment that Jesus is dying for his sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and the whole question of, of Judas is a very, very, um, I think, a, a significant one and and a difficult and a difficult one. We're going to circle back to this because Judas appears a couple more times in this in this narrative. <laughs> but um, but I do want to just. Just kind of put a put an end on this. God, God does not will or force or compel anyone to sin. Okay? So God does not compel people to sin. That's what I mean by saying, saying that God didn't make Judas do this. God does not compel people to sin. God seeks to release people from sin. So just, just the opposite. So we are bound not by God, but by our own sin here. That's what God frees us from. Now maybe that, and, and this is kind of where, <coughs> the reason this matters is as we look at in the world, which is kind of hard not to do sometimes, right? Because it's sort of all around us. And when you look at, at evil in the world, um, it's very easy to ask the question of why does God make these things happen, right? All of you have experienced evil either directly or indirectly in some way or another. And it is, it is tremendously important for us to recognize that God does not compel or make evil happen. Evil is not from God. God will use evil for his own good purpose, but that's not the same as saying that God compels it or makes it happen. I see a lot of furrowed brows, and I recognize that, because this is a, this is a very... Um, this is a, a, a very tricky concept and an important concept to get. If we miss this, we're missing something very significant about how we look at God. Is God the author of evil? Is God the creator of evil or not? Yeah, Dennis. Um, but at, at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't go down the slippery slope of decision theology. Right. Oh, I know. I, yeah, I fully recognize it. I'm only talking about one end of the one way that we fall off the horse here, so to speak. Uh, as, as Lutherans, we're always we're always um, in tension with this kind of fatalism, I'll call it, of, of, of control and this sort of absolute absolute freedom that I can decide at any time to follow Jesus and do everything right if I have the right knowledge. You know, this is why you get in a lot of churches, uh, churches essentially become uh, simply and only about education because if you can inform people about the right stuff, then they're gonna make right decisions, which is just not true. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> It's, you know, I'm all in favor of knowledge, believe me, <laughs> don't get me wrong there. But knowledge does not equal right decision. Well, apologetics. So if God created the world and created everything and there's evil in the world, then God created evil. <clears throat> right. I mean, and that and that's kind of a, a very basic, uh, a basic, basic answer to that. And that would make evil a, a, uh, a, a thing a substance that God creates. 
evil is not a substance. You can't go out and buy a box of evil. <laughs> right? Although it may feel like that sometimes. It's the shell. Depending on what you buy. Right? But um, evil is uh, evil is the absence of God. So e evil as um, negation or something something like that. So, and, I, and I knew we were going to go down these roads when we're talking about the passion because this is exactly what we what we wrestled with in looking at our Lord's death. This is good. This is a good conversation. I'm glad we're having it. I know it's not easy. Yeah. So the follow-on to that is so if God did, maybe God didn't create evil, but He still allowed it. To right. 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 So that's the right. So why did He do that? So why does He allow it? Well. <laughs> That is, of course, why we're looking at, at our Lord's passion and death, is because that is, that is God's solution to evil, <laughs> is, is, to pay the, is to pay the penalty for, for evil for us. Now, as I said, I fully recognize that doesn't answer every question, but I'm just trying to make sure you come back. <laughs> no, no, no. I love to ask a question because I like when you get on wall, you're on walls. Well, you're in the right place then. Okay, so God didn't make evil, but he certainly made suffering, right? So when we say deliver us from temptation, it means deliver us from a trial. Because it says in the Old Testament, have I not made the eye blind and the, the baby mute and all that, which... Well, it does say it says lead us not to t lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Um, it's one of the weird things in the scriptures is that the word test and the word tempt are the same word in Hebrew, but they mean very very different things. If I give Chloe a test, I'm sorry, I didn't notice you were sitting. <laughs> If I give Chloe a test, I'm not trying to get her to do something. What am I doing in, in giving her a test? I'm evaluating what she either knows or understands, or I'm, I'm evaluating something, right? But if I give Chloe the key to the next test that she's gonna take, then I am tempting her to evil. <laughs> now, so so there is a there is a big difference between testing and tempting because they have entirely different purposes. And and whether you're talking about tempting or test testing, you have to figure out some context. God, as as we do say in the Catechism, God tempts no one. God does not tempt us to evil. He does test us to see how. Uh, so that he can know how best, and that and that we can know how best to grow in to grow in faith and love. But that is a very different thing than tempting. So that that difference is a is a really big one, and uh, again, not an easy one. What I would what I would say as to the suffering part is is God. <coughs> God does not create suffering in the sense of, oh, your life is a little bit too easy. Bam, you got leukemia. <laughs> that a learner. <laughs> that's not, that's, that is not, is not how God works. Because God does not desire death or suffering or sickness or evil. <laughs> On any of us, the wages of sin is is death, and so whether we're talking about uh, any time we're talking about sickness, for sure. Let's just take sickness as an example. We're talking about the consequences of the fall in some way or another. You know, so why do I have male pattern baldness? Well, because of the fall into sin. Definitely part of the fall into sin. <laughs> So, or, you know, why do you have whatever sicknesses or diseases or hardships that you have physically? Well, that is because our bodies do not function as they were intended originally because of the fall into sin. That doesn't mean 
that I have male pattern baldness because I made fun of somebody without hair when I was 10, or whatever, right? right? <laughs> but, but it is generally a result of the fall and a result of the fall into sin. So I tend to use the language more of consequences than something else. So let me let me think of another another analogy here. Um, if a, if a, a child does something wrong and they need to be disciplined, would you say that the disciplining is the parent's fault? Or the child's fault. I hope you're going to say it's the child's, <laughs> right? Even though it may be that the parent is doing it. You know, don't touch the stove; it's hot. <laughs> Whatever it might be, and so those consequences come. The wages of sin is death. That is the consequence of that. Now, and I fully recognize that we're in. We're, in, we're treading in very deep waters here. And this, and this gets at a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of challenges that all of us have when it comes to dealing with sin and death and suffering, especially suffering of loved ones and, and all of these things. But, um, but, I, but I think that looking carefully at the passion of our Lord can help us to sort of draw out some of these questions and help them to make sense a little bit more so that so that we can have a better understanding of, of God as God and as one who loves and who is one who is full of mercy and not God as um, you know a dictator that just kind of controls and makes things happen or God as the powerless uh, you know the powerless one who has every good intention but can't do anything because neither of those are true. Neither of those are right. But those are often the, the two that are pitted against each other. Either God can do anything, in which case he's got to be a big meanie because he lets all this bad stuff happen. Or God, God loves us completely, but he's not all powerful because all of this stuff still happens. <laughs> well, both of those are wrong. So yeah, lots, of, lots of things to think on here. Steve, then Dennis, then I'll work my way across the room. Well, I, I don't know. I'm helped by this. I don't know if it helps other people, but Paul kind of explains a little bit of this tension in Romans 11.32. And he uses, it, um, the different, depending on your version, it says, For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. And a different translation would say, Imprisoned, or there would be consigned as well. So God has bound or imprisoned or consigned all the disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And so um, for me, it's more a matter of like perspective. Like my perspective is skewed based on my, you know, my own right and wrong, you know, standards basically of way the way God should or should not behave, right? Whereas he, you know, Paul just kind of lays it out as, yeah, God has power over this and he's done this. For his own good purpose. And, and this and, and this is why and, and that is ultimately kind of how this how this ends is getting at what is God's what is God's good purpose. And it may be that because of the um, because of whatever the suffering is, that I am too close to kind of see the purpose. <laughs> right? Um, I will give you a, a, a very uh, textbook. A example of that. I don't, do any of you know um, Pastor Foley at uh, First Lutheran in Placerville? I know some of you have kind of run across him. Um, Kevin and Anna Foley, very uh, dear, sweet, sweet couple. He's a young pastor. They have three. Uh, they have three, three kids under five, so they have a very active house. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Um, but. Uh, uh, Pastor Foley and his wife Anna had a miscarriage about two weeks ago, something like that. And um, and as all of you probably know, miscarriages are not all that uncommon. <laughs> they they happen pretty regularly. But how we sort of collectively as Christians process them varies widely, quite widely, um, from ignoring it 
hoping it goes away, hoping nobody notices, all the all the way to uh, to doing a full funeral service and everything and everything in between. So if we believe this is a child, we believe this child has died, then then you can see kind of where that goes. Well, I'm I'm kind of Kevin and Anna's pastor. Pastors sort of uh, trade off being pastors to each other. And and so I'm doing the funeral service for their uh, for their unborn child this coming this coming Saturday. So I'll do the service at first, and then Grace Lutheran up in Grass Valley has a has a cemetery, and Grace is very graciously appropriate um, donated a cemetery plot for the interment for the for their child. So then we'll drive over to Grace and do the uh, and do the interment. And um, Catherine and I have. Had I've had two miscarriages. Um, I know that there are people in this room that have had miscarriages, some more than one. And the the underlying question, in my experience with that, is is very often simply the why. You know, why would God let us have this life and then take it away before this child's been born and it didn't have a chance to be baptized and you know and you kind of have the dance of 27,000 questions that you don't have the answers to, which is really frustrating. And on top of that, all of the emotions and hormones and everything else that goes along with pregnancy and an early ending to a pregnancy, it's just a huge mess. It's just a huge mess. And there's no kind of nice and simple right or wrong way on how we are to deal with that or process that as Christians. The way that they've <coughs> chosen to process this, which, which is at my urging, is to do so publicly by having a service and by having a and by having an term, which is something that I, I encourage. Although Catherine and I did not do that for either of our unborn children. I wish we had. But that's a, a, I bring this up simply as an example of the, how do you answer unanswerable questions? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> so how do we in turn as the church point people and ourselves to the mercy of God in the face of unanswerable questions? Right? Well, the first answer to that is we do it together <laughs> because we rarely come up with the right answer if we do it in isolation because that's how that's how Satan always seeks to divide is to isolate to separate to create divisions to, to make it so that uh, you feel like you are alone when you are not alone along the way I know that was a that was a, a total down the rabbit trail ramp, but I think that that, that gives an, a very concrete example of, all right, so how do we as a church try to answer and wrestle with unanswerable, difficult questions? And the first answer to that is we do it together. <laughs> we don't do it apart, and, and we bear one another's burdens, even if the answer might be, I don't know. Sometimes we don't know the answers, right? So we don't know together. <laughs> it's better than not knowing alone. <laughs> it is. <laughs> because at least then you know that you're not crazy. <laughs> or at least not, if you are, you're not by yourself. <laughs> All right. Are there any other <clears throat> questions or comments or kind of follow-ups? I feel like I should take an offering. That was like a, that was like a second sermon or something. <laughs> I'll restrain myself. <laughs> Howard, you've had your hand up a little bit, and then Gary. Okay. You're going to get us back to the it text. It seems that this <laughs> shocker statement here is Jesus saying it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Yeah. But that's not really a shocker because we know that sinners, unrepentant, right. are have weeping and gnashing of teeth oh, right. and being cast into a lake of fire. All right, we've had all of these parables we've been looking at just in the two previous chapters. And there should be no surprises here. Have That's the right. Time, the people that are, have this punishment will say, right. God was right. 
Yeah. But yeah. the shocker statement is this first one up there. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve who mm -hmm. were dirty, rotten sinners. For right. Lutherans say, poor, miserable, poor, miserable sinners. sinners. Yeah. That is the shocker. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that he's there in the first place. I I totally agree, Howard. That is very well said. And and that again and again and again we get this. Okay, and that Jesus is reclining at table with a poor miserable sinner who is going to betray him. <laughs> right? I don't know about you, but I don't tend to eat meals with people who hate me and are going to try to betray me. Right? That that does not kind of line up super well with us. No. Is there another, you know, Dennis? I just uh, wanted to make that point. In the Middle East, to have somebody recline at the table with you means they're part of your family. Right. And that's that right. you are at peace with them regardless of what has happened previously. That's right. That's right. Ta yeah, we could call that table fellowship. <clears throat> that table fellowship means that we we have, I have let you into my home. You are, you are now a part of us and we are a part of you. This is why eating together is so central. And I would even suggest that that's why the Lord's Supper is so central for us. But that's also why our kind of greater fellowship, all of, all of these, I'll, I'll call them secondary events, from Oktoberfest to pancake breakfast to whatever, all of these things are an extension of our saying, we're a family. And we're, and we're a part of this with one another. Yeah, absolutely. I've got just a couple minutes left, but I want to just take a take a second and look at this uh, very famous painting. Closer, please. You can kind of see. And again, remember, this is 16th century. This is not meant to be realistic to the time period, etc. But there are a couple things that are that are right on this. First and first and foremost would be they're all on one side of the table. And it's not just because the photographer told them, "Go, everybody, go get on one side." So we can see. <laughs> but that 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 actually does make uh, make some sense at least. And you can kind of see the. Uh, the, the various, you know, these three conversing with each other. He's acting surprised. We got a, is it me? Um, John is looking very pious. Uh, not me. You know, you get, you get uh, lots of different responses to that. And that, uh, part of what's, what I think is, uh, is remarkable about this is it shows kind of the range of human reaction to the same word of Jesus. Does that make sense? That not everyone responds in the same way at the same time, etc. Yeah. Andy. The hand gestures really say all kinds of things. They do. You see a lot of them say, yes. oh, it's not me, but you've got do we know which one is supposed to be Judas? I don't know that you know. Yes, it? but I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> well, the only one with anything oh. of, of, besides an open hand or got the one in back of his hand with the one finger up uh, is the one next uh, on, on, on Christ's right, the uh, second or third. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And it looks like maybe he's holding something, yeah. but his hand is closed. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that's symbolic. It, does, it does look to me like there might be a money bag there. Yeah. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, the hands on the, on the, on the uh, Christ's left at the far end of the table are sort of like he's doing the whoa. What is I kind of feel like all of the disciples in this painting are Italian. So they're, all, they're all sort of. Uh, what is it? Right, exactly. They're all, they're all talking in their, uh, uh, with their hands. Rick. It's also interesting, if we take back a second, if we were at that table, they're all worried about who did it. Not, yep. oh my gosh, someone's going to kill. Right, yeah, right. Is. They're all worried about where the fault is. Right. They're not yeah. worried about, wait a minute, you're going to die? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah, that's a very good point. That even in the question, they are all kind of selfish in their orientation. Yeah, that's true. All right. My alarm told me that I have to be done now. 
So we will start with verse 20 next week. So let's close with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I'm sorry, verse 20. We'll start with verse 26.